Hey guys, Robbie here from CrossFit South Bend. Today we're going to talk about what causes IBS or irritable bowel syndrome and how to fix it naturally. So, first of all, what is IBS? Well, it's an acronym that stands for irritable bowel syndrome. And one of the things that most people really don't realize about IBS is that this is typically a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that when doctors really don't know what's going on and you've got something that's bothering you digestively, they just say IBS, right? And when you look at the description of what it means, that you know seems to make sense, right? Irritable bowel syndrome. It's like you go to the doctor with a headache and they say you have head achy syndrome. That'll be four hundred dollars, please. Um, you know, it's not really telling you anything you didn't already know. It's just naming a collection of symptoms, and that's important because unless you know what the root cause of the issue is you're not going to be able to figure out how to fix it. So IBS is really just a fancy name for this collection of symptoms. It's, it's really not that much different from saying you have a headache and going to your doctor and they say you have headachey syndrome. So uh, we want to figure out what's actually causing IBS most of the time so that we can figure out how to fix it and not just control symptoms. So what's the main cause of IBS. So there are a number of contributing factors to IBS, but the headline is that studies have shown up to 84% of cases of IBS are actually cases of something called SIBO. Now you may not have heard of SIBO before, and I would say most people haven't, but it's coming more and more into the popular consciousness and people, especially those who have IBS, are starting to learn a bit more about um, what this is, how it comes about, and how it can lead to IBS. So what is SIBO? Well, again, we've got another acronym here, just like IBS. SIBO stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth. So what does that all mean? So in order to understand uh, what that means, we need to take a little trip into uh, the way the digestive system works. So. To simplify things a lot, there are basically three main parts to your uh, digestive system. There's the stomach, there's the small intestine, and then there's the large intestine. So in the stomach, what typically happens isn't digestion uh, proper. Like when we think of the stomach, we typically tend to think of digestion, but really what's going on in the stomach is food is being broken down so that it can eventually be digested in the small and the large intestine, meaning you know, the body can absorb certain nutrients in the small intestine and then certain bacteria can, um, you know, feed on certain things from the stomach later on when they get to the large intestine or to the colon. But the stomach is really just breaking down stuff with acid to make it more digestible eventually for the small intestine. The stomach, uh, as far as we know currently, has no bacteria in it. It's basically sterile and Part of the reason for this, as you might imagine, is, well, there's a lot of acid in it to kill all the potential bad, you know, things that you might be digesting that could harm you. So there's no bacteria in the stomach, uh, as far as we know. In the small intestine, which is where the vast majority of your nutrients are absorbed by your body, there's some bacteria, there should be some, but it's a very, 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 very small amount relative to the large intestine, which has a ton of bacteria, um, you know, trillions of bacteria. So um, there should be some bacteria in your small intestine, but not too much. Now, what can happen is if you're not digesting your food properly, either because you ate it too quickly and you're stressed, or you're not producing enough stomach acid, or you have pancreatic uh, insufficiency or if you have you know just a general dysbiosis in your gut or if you have a gut pathogen or yeast overgrowth or anything like that if for whatever reason you aren't digesting things properly sometimes what can happen is that you know uh, a large amount of bacteria in your large intestine can actually back up into your small intestine and create an overgrowth there's actually a valve that's supposed to protect the contents of your large intestine from flowing back into the contents of your small intestine. And one of the things that can happen with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is that that valve becomes dysfunctional and certain bacteria from the large intestine are 
let back up into the small intestine. So what's going on with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth isn't necessarily that you have too many bad bacteria in the small intestine. Rather, it's that good, helpful bacteria that should be in the large intestine are where they shouldn't be, namely the small intestine. So it's really a case of where bacteria that should be in the large intestine has now backed up into the small intestine and overgrown. So that's really what's going on with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And this can lead to all sorts of digestive symptoms. As we've talked about in previous videos, the main cause of heartburn and reflux is not too much stomach acid. It is not too much stomach acid. More often than not, it's too little stomach acid. And the way too little stomach acid can lead to reflux and heartburn is something like SIBO, where you have too many bacteria in your small intestine that then ferment the food that you're eating uh, excessively, more than, more than they should, and it backs up and pushes up and then leads to uh, reflux and potentially heartburn. Uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can lead to diarrhea, it can lead to constipation, and it can lead to all sorts of symptoms that have nothing to do with digestion. Nothing. Again, this is one of the main differences between functional medicine and conventional medicine. Conventional medicine says, oh, you have a skin issue? That doesn't have anything to do with uh, the gut. Although, interestingly, uh, maybe a little bit with the skin issue, it's interesting. Uh, some dermatologists will give antibiotics uh, to clear up a skin issue, and you might ask yourself, hmm, well, if it's a skin issue, why are they giving stuff to help with your gut? Well, it's because your gut is related to your skin. If you have a brain issue, typically they say, oh, go see a neurologist. If you have a thyroid issue, they'll say, oh, go see an endocrinologist. If you have a heart issue, go see a cardiologist, without recognizing that the gut is intimately related to all of those different organ systems. And if you have SIBO, it can manifest as digestive systems, but, or excuse me, it can manifest as digestive symptoms, but it need not. Symptoms can be far removed from uh, their actual cause. So you could feel fatigue, the 2 p.m. slump, crappy sleep, bad skin, uh, not able to recover from workouts, low testosterone, all from something like SIBO. So you shouldn't think to yourself, oh, I don't have any digestive symptoms, therefore I don't have SIBO. No, it can be uh, the cause of many different symptoms. So there are three main types of SIBO. Uh, there is hydrogen dominant SIBO, SIBO where uh, the bacteria that uh, colonize uh, the small intestine are producing predominantly hydrogen. This is typically associated with increased motility, i.e. diarrhea and you know, increased stool frequency uh, and urgency. There is uh, methane-based SIBO, which was thought at one point to be the result of bacteria producing uh, methane overgrowing in the small intestine, but it's actually a group of organisms called archaea that produce methane. And um, methane-based SIBO or methanogenic SIBO, however you want to call it, is one of the main causes of constipation. If you introduce, uh, there have been animal studies where they introduce methane gas into the intestines of certain animals and it immediately slows down motility. So if someone is suffering from constipation, uh, something to check into is methane-based SIBO. Now again, you can have methane-based SIBO without having constipation. It's, it's still possible. It could be causing other symptoms, but uh, most traditionally it's associated with, um, with uh, constipation. Then hydrogen sulfide, which unfortunately we don't currently have a way to do a test for. Uh, hydrogen and methane, the best way to do a test, or the least invasive and most effective way to do a test is a breath test. Um, hydrogen sulfide we don't currently have a way to test for, but if someone tests positive for SIBO, uh, there are certain clues like rotten egg smelling breath, rotten egg smelling gas, uh, all of those can lead to the, um, the inference that um, there might be something with uh, you know, excess hydrogen sulfide.